all right? This morning's sermon is going to be a little bit different than usual. It's going to be a two-part sermon. I'm going to be preaching on oneness Pentecostalism exposed. Oneness Pentecostalism in light of the Bible. Now, this is, as I said, going to be a two-part series. A two-part series. This morning I'm going to be focusing on some of the beliefs of oneness Pentecostalism or of just Pentecostalism in general, and then this evening I'm going to be going into more depth on the oneness aspect and our differences and our distinctions in clarity with what is known as classical modalism or what is known as the modern oneness movement. The, the major differences in the Godhead of what we believe, what the Bible teaches, and Christianity, biblical Christianity, compared to the false oneness Pentecostal movement. Now, how many people in here, like, I just want to, just a raise of hands, how many people in here grew up as a Pentecostal or maybe went to a Pentecostal church at times in their lives? Not myself, I'm just, as an example, so maybe three people. Okay, so I, I don't know the numbers, but let me just say this, just by starting out. Number one, it is biblical to call out false teachers and false religions. Amen. In the writings of Paul, he does it repeatedly. It is to warn those who are the true believers, not to be sucked into that which is false and that which is against biblical Christianity. So that you can beware of this. Now, you may have a family member in this. And another way that you can use this sermon this morning is you can take the biblical truths that are in this sermon and you can present them to, to these people. And you can show them that what they're believing is not biblical Christianity. Now, there are, a reason why, there are reasons why we call ourselves a Baptist. There's a reason why churches call themselves Lutheran. There are reasons why churches call themselves Pentecostals, what have you, right? They represent certain beliefs. There are core beliefs of Baptists. That's why we are Baptists. I don't agree with everything the Baptists believe, but I believe the core tenets of being a Baptist. When, when Baptists are wrong, I'll say Baptists are wrong. And you know, we should do the same thing about other false denominations of Christianity. Right. When Lutherans are wrong, we should call them out. When Pentecostals are wrong, we should point it out and call them out. I want to warn my children so that they don't grow up and get sucked into something that's false. Right. We need to know what is truth and what is not. And you say, well, all these different religions... You know, all these different denominations of Christianity, you know, they're all just versions of Christianity. They're all just saying the same thing, just in a different way. They're not. And I'm going to show you that very clearly from the Bible. So how do we decide what truth is? We take the Bible and we look at what each group believes. That's how we decide what truth is. I brought this up last Sunday morning in that sermon. It doesn't matter what your views are on any subject, politically, you know, any, any subject that you can imagine. If your views disagree with the Bible, then you're wrong and the Bible's right. If my views disagree with the Bible, then I'm wrong and the Bible's right. Amen. That's just how it works. Amen. And do you believe the Bible that God's word is truth or not? God's word is truth. Jesus said, thy word is truth. So what we do is we look at what a Pentecostal believes, and then we compare it to the Bible, and we can clearly see that there are many errors with it. And we would do this with any religion, as I said. Now, I want to begin here in, in Proverbs chapter number 25. There's a verse I want to focus on. Specifically, it's verse number 14. Now, we don't use this word very often, but it is, it is a charismatic or charisma. The Pentecostal movement is also known as the charismatic movement. If you look that up, I'm going to be reading it. I believe it's even mentioned in Wikipedia. It is referred to as the charismatic movement. Now, who is familiar with what the definition of charismatic is? We're going to get into the sermon specifically here in just a minute. We don't use this word very often, so I'm not surprised that, that no one in here actually knows what the word charismatic means. So a couple people at least. What does it mean? Gifted. Gifted. Exactly. That's the definition of the word charismatic. If you say, man, he has some charisma. You've heard people say that before? They're saying that guy's gifted. He's talented, right? That's what they're saying. That's what the word charismatic or charisma means. Well, the Pentecostal movement... They are always boasting and bragging about all of their gifts, aren't they? All of the gifts of the Spirit. That's what they're always talking about. Have you been baptized in the Holy Ghost? Have you been baptized in the Holy Spirit? Have you, do you speak with tongues or in tongues, as they put it? We're going to go over all these things in just a moment. And they're always talking about the gifts of the Spirit and how they have the gifts of the Spirit. And how that's the evidence of salvation. That's why they have been known as the charismatic movement. Because they say they have all these gifts. But I'm going to prove to you this morning that they don't really have these gifts that they say that they have. That they're actually boasting, things, boasting themselves of a false gift. I want you to look there in Proverbs chapter number 25. Look at verse.
verse number 14, what the Bible says here. Proverbs 25, verse 14. Whoso boasted himself of a false gift is like clouds and wind without rain. You know, a farmer can relate to this very much so. They're waiting for something, right? They're waiting for rain. They have to have rain. They have to have, you know, uh, uh, you know, certain seasons that cause their crops to produce in such a way. And they're standing there and they're waiting for the rain to come. And that can be, I'm sure, stressful for a farmer. When that, that is where your finances are laid. And then they see that cloud coming, right? They see that cloud coming and they're thinking, oh, this for sure has rain in it. And then it just passes over and it has nothing. That is a perfect example of what you have in the charismatic movement today. They boast themselves of a gift. They boast themselves of speaking in tongues or, or ha having the gifts of healing or all of these different sorts of things. But really all they're doing is just talking. They look like they have a gift. They act like they have a gift. But you know what it is? It's a false gift. There's no difference in them and a cloud without rain, a wind without rain. They are not truly charismatic, according to the Bible. I'm gonna, uh, one thing that I'm going to be spending the majority of the time on is what they really, they really uh, boast of the most, and that is the speaking in tongues. And I'm going to debunk the modern movement of speaking in tongues this morning and show you that it's a sham. Now, who this morning says, I believe the Bible? Everyone should raise their hand. Amen. So if I can show every person in here from the Bible that the modern movement of tongues, speaking in tongues is false, everyone would believe it, right? right. Of course, right? Amen. Well, let's look at the Bible this morning. Let's look at the Bible. Now, we're going to get to that in a moment, but first we're going to start with the most important thing, and that is salvation. The one that's Pentecostal is just like every denomination of Christianity practically outside of Baptists and some evangelical Christians who would turn themselves as not, uh, you know, uh, uh, non-denominational or just evangelical, as I said. They're wrong about the gospel as well. They add works unto salvation. First, I'm going to give you very quickly, before I jump into that, I kind of got ahead of myself. I want to read to you uh, just the first paragraph, the introduction paragraph off of Wikipedia of the Oneness Pentecostal movement. Because it is a very specific sect, if you will, of Pentecostalism, the Oneness Pentecostal movement. And not only within the Godhead do they, do they differ on views, there are other areas wherein they differ from just the modern or, or majority of Pentecostals. Now, this is off of Wikipedia, as I said. One is Pentecostalism, also known as apostolic or Jesus' name. Pentecostalism is a movement within the Christian family of churches known as Pentecostalism. It derives its distinctive name from its teaching on the Godhead, which is popularly, popularly referred to as the Oneness Doctrine, a form of modalistic monarchianism. This doctrine states that there is one God, a singular divine spirit who manifests himself in many ways, including his Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Now, I'm going to be focusing on more on that tonight, as I said. This stands in sharp contrast to the doctrine of three distinct and eternal persons posited by Trinitarian theology. Oneness believers baptized in the name of Jesus Christ rather than using the Trinitarian formula. The Oneness Pentecostal movement first emerged in America around 1914. If you study this out, this is accurate. This is all correct. I've looked this up quite a bit, so this is correct. As a result of doctrinal disputes within the nascent uh, Pentecostal movement and, cla and claims an estimated 24 million adherents today. That is huge. That is a large portion of Pentecostals that would consider themselves oneness Pentecostals. 24 million oneness Pentecostals in the world today. I didn't look up the number just to see what percentage they are of who claims to be Pentecostal in general, but I guarantee that that is at least half, if not three quarters of that. That is a huge number. That's a big number. Uh, 24 million adherents today was often pejoratively, that's like derogative is what that means, uh, in a negative way, pejoratively referred to as the Jesus-only movement in its early days. For a list of denominations in this movement, see list of oneness Pentecostal denominations. <clears throat> There's a link there you could click on. Besides their beliefs about the Godhead, oneness Pentecostals differ, differ significantly, now this is what I want to focus on right now, from most other Pentecostal and Evangelical Christians in matters of soteriology, that is salvation, how we are saved. So they differ drastically, it says. And they differ, you know, it significantly is the word that it uses here, in matters of salvation. Whereas most Pentecostals and Evangelicals believe that only faith in Jesus Christ is the essential element for salvation. And Pentecostals in general are wrong as well. 
Because we don't, you know, believe only that it is you know, one of the essential elements for salvation in the sense that you have to do other things. This says the essential element, but when you speak to Pentecostals, they always believe that you have to be a good person right, to get to right. heaven. In some way or another, right. they never believe that that is the only element. Mm -hmm. They never do. <clears throat> now, it's, and then it says, oneness Pentecostalism defines salvation as repentance, full submersion, water, baptism in the name of Jesus Christ, and baptism in the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in other tongues. Now, that's what I want to focus on this morning. I listened to the most prominent oneness Pentecostal throughout this week. I've listened to other things that he's preached and, 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 and stuff in the past just to, do, to, uh, to uh, get clarity on what this guy believes. His name is David Bernard. He's very popular within the oneness Pentecostal movement. David Bernard is without a shadow of a doubt unsaved. Right. I listened to him repeatedly this week on salvation. Not the subject necessarily of the oneness of God. All week I listened to him on salvation. And I heard out of his own mouth probably 30 times this week. And I maybe listened to five, six hours. And over and over I listened to these same things that I could find of him talking about salvation. I probably heard him say five, six times that salvation is a process. Salvation is a process. I want you to turn to John chapter number 5, verse number 24. Let's look at that in light of the Bible. Now, we can see that Wikipedia is accurate in it teaches as well that the or it, it tells us as well that the oneness Pentecostal movement believes that salvation is a process, doesn't it? There is not just one step. There are multiple steps to salvation according to oneness Pentecostalism. Not according to the Bible, but according to oneness Pentecostals. Again, let me read this to you. This is what they believe you have to do to be saved. They believe that you have to Repent, And he says, repent of your sins. He says that over and over again. He didn't even just say repent one time. He never just said, you got to repent and do this. He, he said, repent of your sins every time. So this says repentance, full submersion. And that's not right. You wouldn't say submersion. You'd say immersion. So full immersion through water baptism. And it has to be in the name of Jesus or it, it's invalid. You can't be saved unless you're baptized and they say the name of Jesus. But it has to be water baptism and baptism in the Holy Ghost. And they do not believe that that happens right when you're baptized either. Some Pentecostals believe that. Oneness Pentecostals do not believe that. They believe that you can put your faith in Jesus, repent of your sins, and begin your process. And, and you start sanctifying yourself. Getting sins out of your life. And you begin doing that which is right in the sight of God. Keeping God's commandments. And then over a period of time, you know, maybe you'll get water baptized in the name of Jesus later, and you continue to sanctify yourself, and then, you know, more time goes on, and then you get to the point of sanctification where you can receive the Holy Ghost. And the evidence is that they say you speak in tongues. And that's, of course, the modern movement of speaking in tongues, right? So they believe that this is a process. There's one verse in the Bible that could not be any more clear that salvation is not a process. That salvation is dependent upon one thing, and it happens instantaneous. I want you to look down at your Bible at John chapter number 5, verse number 24. Look at this. Jesus speaking. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me. So what do you have to do to be saved? Believe. you got to believe. That's it. One thing you have to do is believe. You have to put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. So there's only one thing you have to do. Now watch what happens at the moment you believe. One more time from the beginning. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me, hath, that's half, that's present tense, has everlasting life, now watch this, and shall not come, that's future tense, shall not come into condemnation. Then he explains why. But is, now is that past, present, or future? Present. present. But is past from death unto life. Now, does that sound like a process to be saved or to be passed from death unto life? Not even slightly. How many requirements are there? Do you have to be baptized in water baptism, immersion in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, sanctified, filled with the Holy Ghost, speaking with tongues, and repent of all your sins? No, no. no you do not. In David Bernard's presentation of the gospel, not one time would he mention even believe half the time. He would occasionally say faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, but you know what he does? He adds all of these different steps to salvation. All of these different steps, showing you that he's not only trusting in Jesus, he's trusting in his own works. Right. 
He may think Jesus is his savior, but the Bible is very clear, and if by works, then is it no more of grace. So if you have any works involved in your salvation at all, if you think that you have to lift your pinky finger to get you to heaven, unfortunately, you're not saved. Right. You have to be fully putting your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible is very clear. It's, it's either by grace or it's by works. Right. And if by grace, then is it no more of works. Otherwise, grace is no more grace. The only way that it can be grace is if you're not working for it at all. How much do you have to pay for something in order to make it not a gift? Anything at all. If you pay a penny for something, right? Well, the Bible says that salvation is by grace and it's a gift of God. Ephesians 2, 8, 9 says, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So there's only two categories. There's not a gray area. There are those that are saved only by the grace of God who have only, they, they put their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ only. They don't have their faith in anything else, only the Lord Jesus Christ. And then there are over here, People that are unsaved in this category. And you know what? There's a variation of what they're trusting in. But guess what? They're trusting in other things other than the Lord Jesus Christ. Right. And if you're trusting in anything other than Jesus, unfortunately, you're not saved. Right. You have to be trusting in Jesus Christ alone. It's either by grace or it's by works. It's either all by grace or by works all. There's no gray area in between. You're either saved or you're unsaved. Now, John 5, 24, let's begin. Let's make sure that everyone understands each verse very clearly. Can it be any more clear to debunk that salvation is not a process? Can, th can this verse be any more clear? It says, when you hear my word, and then you, and this is what you do in response. This is the only requirement on your part. Believe what I said. When you believe what the Lord Jesus Christ said, at that moment you receive everlasting life. And at that moment you are, if this pulpit is... I, I think I might, my stride is long enough. If this pulpit is the line between death and life, you are at that moment passed from death unto life. Amen. At that very moment. There's not a process. It's instantaneous. You are saved. Past tense saved. It's over. Right. You have everlasting life. Now, I want you to, the uh, first thing I want to focus on is the first thing that David Bernard brings up repeatedly, and it's also what's brought up here in their, uh, in, in Wikipedia when it's speaking about salvation for one that's Pentecostal, and that is repentance. And so many people are confused about what repentance means. Well, they define repentance actually in Wikipedia, and these are all these are all taken from sources of oneness Pentecostal. So this is what a oneness Pentecostal believes. They refine repentance as a complete reformation of life. A complete reformation of life. That is the exact words that the oneness Pentecostal uh, movement uses about repentance. Now, I'm going to show you that the word repentance or to repent means nothing along those lines at all. People are very confused about the, the definition of the word repent. I want you to go to Genesis chapter number 6. Genesis chapter number 6. Now, something that's very important to know is that the phrase, repent of your sins, is never found in the Bible one time. Right, right. The phrase, repent of your sins, is never found in the Bible one time. David Bernard probably 50 times said, you got to repent of your sins to be saved. You got to repent of your sins to be saved. You got to repent of your sins to be saved over and over and over again. And he defined and explained that as a complete reformation of life. So, what is David Bernard trusting in in order to get him to heaven? Works. His works. changed life, his works. He's turned over a new leaf and he thinks he's a good enough guy now, doesn't he? He thinks that he is a good enough person and he has reformed his life, right? It's up to the person, right, in order to change your life. And you should change your life. But if you're trusting in that to get you to heaven, you're not going. That's right. You should repent of your sins, but that's not for salvation. Right. You should live a holy, godly life, but not to go to heaven. That doesn't get you to heaven. I go to out knocking doors. I try to live my life as strict as I can according to the Bible standards. But I'm not trusting in that to get me to heaven. I'm trusting in the blood of Jesus Christ only and nothing else. Amen. And that's what we have to trust in. Now, when we look at the word repent in the Bible, a lot of people will just uh, automatically assume that the word repent means repent of your sins. Because first you, 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 know, you confront them, well, repent of your sins is never found in the Bible one time. And then they say, well, the word repent just means repent of your sins. Let me ask you this question. Does God have sin? No. Is God a sinner? No. No. Do you know who repents in the Bible more than anyone else? God. God repents in the Bible more than anyone else. So is it possible that God is repenting of sin? No. No. 
You don't need to go back to the Greek. You can just understand it as I'm going to show you here in just a moment of, of just reading it in the English Bible. But the word repent just comes from a word that means a change of mind. It, mean, it comes from a Greek word that means metanoia. Meta means change, like metamorphosis. The meta means change. Noia is like from paranoid. The noi on there means your mind. So metanoia means a change of mind. The definition of the word repent or repentance means to just change your mind. Right. That's all that the word repent means. Amen. So what God's doing is changing his mind. He's changing his mind. Look at Genesis chapter number 6. Genesis chapter number 6. Look at verse number 6. It says this, And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him. At his heart. Is God repenting his sins here? No, he is not. What is he doing? He's changing his mind. He made man, and now he's thinking, man, he, you know, I wish I wouldn't have made man, basically. He's changing his mind about the course of action that he had already made, and it repented him, and he's taking a different course of action in the sense of his mind, right? It repented him that he had made man on the earth. Does everyone understand so far? It's just the change of mind that God made. I want you to go over to Jonah chapter number 3, verse number 10. We're going to kill two birds with one stone. <coughs> Jonah chapter number 3, verse number 10. We'll look at the word repent again here. Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah. Look at Jonah chapter number 3, verse number 10. The word evil also in the Bible does not mean sin or sinful. So that's another thing that you need to understand. In the King James Bible, the word evil oftentimes will just mean harmful. It's kind of like how we use the word bad today. You know how the word bad and evil, they're interchangeable? Well, sometimes you'll just say, man, they got into a bad car accident. What do you mean by that? They got into a harmful car accident, right? It was very harmful, right? You're not saying it was like sinfully evil or immoral, right? You're just saying it was harmful. Well, that's what the word evil in the Bible means. It can sometimes be talking about something that's sinful, just like we can use the word bad that way. But a lot of times it's just saying something harmful, right? Well, look at Jonah chapter number 3, verse number 10. It says this, And God saw their works, that they turned from their evil way, and God repented of the evil that he had said that he would do unto them. Now, if you're familiar with the story, God was going to destroy the uh, city of Nineveh, right? He was going to destroy that city. And he repented of that harm that he was going to do unto them because he saw their works. Now, like I said, I want to kill two birds with one stone quickly while we're here. I want you to turn over to Ephesians chapter number 2. Ephesians chapter number 2. I alluded to this already, and that is that we are not saved by our works, right? I, I actually quoted this exact verse, but I want to compare two things quickly. I want you to look at Ephesians chapter number 2, verse number 8. I want you to see how clearly the Bible teaches that we are saved by grace through faith and not of works. Now, look at Ephesians chapter number 2, verse number 8. The Bible says this, For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. Nothing that you do. You're not earning it, right? It is the gift of God. How much is a gift? How much does a gift cost? Free. It's free, right? If you have to pay a penny for something, it's not a gift, right? It's no longer a gift. So that means it has to be free. That's why it's by faith and not of our works. It is the gift of God. Now watch what it says next. Not of works, lest any man should boast. So are we saved by our own works? No. We are not, right? Well, the word repent, go back to Jonah chapter number 3, verse number 10. The word repent, if you look it up in a dictionary, a, a very loose definition of the word repent means to turn, right? So you have to be, you have to look in the Bible and by the context, you have to figure out what is being repented of or what is being turned from, right? So here in Jonah chapter number 3, verse number 10, I want you to notice what this verse says one more time. And keep in mind, we just read a verse that said we're not saved by our works, right? Look at verse number 10. And God saw their works that they turned from their evil way. Now, what did they do here? What did they do in this particular verse? They turn from their evil way. What does it mean to turn? It means to repent, right? Right? So they turn from their evil way. They repented of their sin in this situation, right? This is an example of someone actually repenting of their sin, right? They turn from their evil way. And look at the very beginning of that verse. Do you notice what God calls and he defines? He, when he looks at that and he sees them turning from their evil way, repenting of their sins, what does he say they're doing? Look at verse number 10 again. And God saw their works. 
You notice that? And God saw their works. That they turned from their evil way. Are we saved by our works? No. We're not. So are we saved by repenting of our sins? No. No, we're not. Because repenting of your sins is works. According to the Bible's definition. That's right. According to the Bible's definition. Now the phrase repent of your sins is never found in the Bible. The word repent is found in the Bible and it means change of mind. Or in context, sometimes that you could say they repented of their works. Like in this, they use the word turn, right? But when we see that, God clearly defines for us elsewhere that we are not saved by turning from our evil way or saved by turning from our works, as in this case he defines that as works. So we are not saved by repenting of our sins. What are we saved by? Belief, by faith, clearly, every time. That's what I want to look at here in just a moment. Go to, uh, I'll have you go ahead and turn to Acts chapter number 16, verse number 30. I'm going to read two verses to you quickly. I want you to go to Acts chapter number 16, verse number 30. Acts chapter number 16, verse number 30. I'm going to read to you from Mark chapter number 1, verse number 15. Now the word repent is found when people are preaching the gospel. Because you do need to repent to be saved. But that does not mean that you are repenting of your sins. Do you know what you need to do? You need to change your mind and believe the gospel. Amen. You don't believe the gospel right now. And you need to repent and believe the gospel. Right. Mark chapter number 1 verse number 15 says this. And saying the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye and believe the gospel. So what is he telling them to do? Change. They, is he talking to people that believe the gospel? No. So what do they need to do? They need to change and repent from not believing the gospel to believing the gospel. Right. I want you to uh, stay there in Acts chapter number 16. I'm going to read you now from Matthew 21 Verse number 32, where the Bible defines, when we're talking about salvation, the Bible defines repentance as a change of unbelief from unbelief to belief. Matthew 21, 32, it says this, For John came unto you in the way of righteousness, and ye believed him not. So they do not believe, right? Ye believed him not, but the publicans and the harlots believed him. And ye, when ye had seen it, repented not afterward that ye might believe him. You notice that? So what, what state were they in when, when uh, John came to them? Unbelief. John came unto you in the way of righteousness, and ye believed him not. But the publicans and the harlots believed him. And ye, when ye had seen it, repented not afterward that ye might, what? Believe him. So what's the repentance? You didn't believe, and you didn't repent that you would believe. So what's the change that's taking place? Believe. Mm -hmm. The word repent does not mean repent of your sins. Amen. When we're talking about salvation, it means a change from unbelief to belief. And you can have whatever definition you want, but don't say the Bible teaches that. Right. Because that is not the definition. I can prove to you backwards and forwards that the Bible is consistent, that the word repent when it comes to salvation means to change from unbelief to belief. There's one requirement of salvation. It is not being a good person. It is not changing your life. It is not reforming your life. It is putting your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And if you want to tell someone they have to repent, you better not say repent of your sins. You better say repent and believe. And you know what? In this day and age, you need to clarify that. Right. Because the majority of people don't understand what the word repent means. So when you start saying repent, what's popping in everybody's mind? Change my life. Turn over a new leaf. So if you want to use, I suggest that if you want to use the word repent today, because everyone has a false definition of it and it's not the Bible's definition, then you need to explain to them what you mean by repent. I personally don't even use the word repent until the very, very end of my gospel sometimes. Because I don't want to confuse them. And you say, you don't use the word repent? Neither does the book of John. The entire gospel of John never uses the word repent one single time. And at the very end of the book of John, the writer tells you that all these things were written so that ye might believe and that ye might have life believing through his name. The whole purpose of the book of John is to get you saved. And do you know what word is not in the book of John one time? Repent. Not one single time. So you know what I don't need to mention when I go to somebody's door to give them the gospel? I don't need to mention the word repent one time. I don't need to say repent even one time. Do you know why? Because if I explain to them they need to believe, and then they do believe, guess what they did, whether they know it or not? They repented. 
They repented from their unbelief to their belief. Go to Acts chapter number 16, verse number 30. Acts chapter number 16, verse number 30. I have a lot of material. We're going to be flipping a lot, but you're going to learn a lot this morning. Go to Acts chapter number 16, verse number 30. Acts chapter number 16, verse number 30. And brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Very, very clear, right? What do I have to do to go to heaven? What do I have to do to be saved? It's the one time in clarity that the, that the question is asked in the whole Bible. Where it's a clear question, what do I have to do to go to heaven? What do I have to do to be saved? It's talked about a lot. And the answer, as we're going to look at in just a moment, is the same every single time. But here's the one time the question is asked in clarity. Look at verse 31. And they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. What does the Bible teach you have to do to go to heaven? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Did he say repent of your sins and believe on the Lord? Did he say go to church? Did he say be baptized? Did he say you have to have a complete reformation of life like the one that's been a gospel's preach? Do you have to be baptized in the Holy Spirit and speak with tongues in order to go to heaven? No. What do you have to do? Believe. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. One thing. There's one requirement. There's not multiple requirements. Salvation is not a process. Right. Salvation is instantaneous and it takes place when the one requirement is fulfilled. Amen. When you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. I want you to, uh, we looked at this already, Ephesians 2, 8, 9, so we'll skip that. I want you to go to John 6, 47. We'll look at the consistency when the Lord Jesus Christ was preaching the gospel while he was on earth. John 6, 47. John 6, 47 reads, Jesus speaking, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that believeth on me hath everlasting life. How simple is salvation? As simple as just putting your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. All right. Putting all of your faith and all of your trust in Jesus. He that believeth on me hath, that's present tense, remember that, hath right now everlasting life. I want you to go to Galatians chapter 2 verse 16. Let's look at this again. Galatians chapter 2 verse 16. Galatians 2 16 says this. Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law. Galatians 2.16, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Jesus Christ that we might be justified by the faith of Christ. And not by the works of the law. Now look at this. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. The Bible is so clear contrast the two. You are not justified by the works of the law, but... You're saved by faith. Amen. By grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Uh, Romans 3.28 is one of my favorite verses in the whole Bible. It says, we conclude that a man, we conclude that, therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. I like how it says without. Amen. We're saved by faith. Without, they have nothing to do with it, without the deeds of the law. It has nothing to do with my salvation, whether I love my neighbor. Should I love my neighbor? Yes. Should I go to church? Yes. But I'm not justified by that, and I'm not saved by that. Amen. If you are trusting in that, you're going to go to hell. Right. Unfortunately, you are going to go to hell. And that's one of the reasons why I wanted to preach this as well. People that maybe get the opportunity to listen to this, that maybe are one that's Pentecostal. You know what? And then they hear the, the clarity of the gospel. The clarity of how easy it is to be saved. You are not saved by being a good person. And if you are trusting in that, you are not going to make it to heaven. If you are trusting in the works of the law, you're not going to make it. You have to have a time when you put all of your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. You heard the gospel, you trusted Jesus, and you were saved and you were passed at that moment from death unto life. Let's look at another verse. Go to Romans chapter number 4, verse number 4. Romans chapter number 4, verse number 4. Romans chapter number 4, verse number 4. I want to hurry through this portion in the beginning. <clears throat> Although it is the most important subject when it comes to the Bible, of salvation, of course, but uh, most of us are already very familiar with it. I want to spend some time on tongues at the end here because that's emphasized so much by Oneness Pentecostals. I want you to look at Romans 4, 4, 4, 4, and 5. Look how clear this is. Now to him that worketh, that's a person that's working, that believes that they're going to get themselves to heaven by working. They're working their way to heaven, according to them. Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. You notice that? If a person believes that they're getting themselves to heaven by being a good person, they're not given grace. They're given debt. Look at verse 5. But to him that worketh not, 
So notice this is a person that's not working for his salvation at all. He is not trusting in his own works at all. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly. His faith is counted for righteousness. What is he though? But the, notice what it said. But believeth on him that justifieth the, what's that word? So what is this guy? Is he a good guy? No, because no one's good. That's the reason why no one will ever make it to heaven. All these people that think that they're working their way to heaven, they're ungodly. You know what they're going to be when they stand before Christ? Ungodly. They're going to stand before God and they think they're good enough to get into heaven. But you know when God looks at them through the eyes of truth, because he's only truth, what does he see? An ungodly person. And they think they were good enough. No one can get themselves to heaven because we're all sinners. Right. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. It doesn't matter how good of deeds you do in your life. You may have, you could be the most righteous person that has ever lived, but you're still ungodly. Right. You may be more, uh, more, more righteous than a lot of other people, but you're still ungodly. You have, your, you have a lot of your own sins. Yeah. A lot of, you have a lot of sins. If we were to be able to just look at the real of your life and the mind that, that you've had all throughout your life, I'm sure there's a lot of wicked things in there. Right. We're all sinners, and, and what it comes down to is you have to be humble enough. You have to have humility and understand that I cannot get, I can do nothing to get myself to heaven. I have to fully trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. Right. I have to put all of my faith in Jesus. Amen. And that's what it comes down to. What's the deciding factor between those that are trusting in their own works and those that are trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ alone? It comes down to humility. That's what it comes down to. That you can admit, I'm ungodly. I'm going to put all my faith in him. And because God loves us so much, he looks at my faith and he changes it into righteousness. He looks at my faith and he counts that for righteousness. And then when he looks at me, what am I? I'm a righteous man. By my own deeds? No. By my faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Man. <clears throat> I want you to go now to... <laughs> I'm going to have you turn to Romans chapter number 1. Just because we're close by here. Romans chapter number 1. One of the things that they mentioned was that water baptism is what saves you, right? Water baptism is what saves you. Well, I just preached for like 10, 15 minutes showing you that it's not of works. What do you have to do? What is water baptism? You got to get up. You got to go to the pastor. You got to say, I want to be baptized. What are you doing during this? You're working. You're moving. You're working. This is something you're doing, right? You know, you're being baptized. You have to agree to do all these things, right? It's a work. Whether they want to try to define it as not being a work, it's a work. So water baptism is already debunked right now. We could just stop and say, well, we know we're not bad. It says repeatedly, anything other than faith is a work. That's what it keeps contrasting. What were the two contrasts? We're not saved by works. We're saved by faith. Is water baptism faith in Christ? No. Then you're not saved by water baptism. It's a work. It doesn't matter how hard it is or how easy it is. It's a work. It doesn't matter. It's a work. But I'm going to prove to you from the Bible that it's a work. I'm going to show you from the Bible two different ways that the Bible says that being baptized is a work. First, I want you to look in Romans chapter number 1, verse number 16. Romans chapter number 1, verse number 16. The Bible tells you, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes. So what saves you again? Believing, right? But specifically, what's the power of God unto salvation here? The gospel. Notice that. It says, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is, talking about the gospel, the power of God unto salvation. Now, what is the gospel? The word gospel means good news. That's what the word gospel means. It means good tidings, okay? And it is the good news of Jesus Christ's death, Burial and resurrection. That is what the Bible defines gospel in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 3 and 4. If you want to look that up, you can do that later. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 3 and 4 defines the gospel or the good news as the death, burial, and resurrection. What Jesus did to save us, and all we do is we put all of our faith in his death, burial, and resurrection. So do you notice that there? It says that... The gospel is what saves us, right? It's the gospel that saves us. Well, I want you to flip over to 1 Corinthians chapter number 1. 1 Corinthians chapter number 1. Paul here, 1 Corinthians chapter number 1, the very next book <coughs> in your Bible. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter number 1, and I want you to look at verse number 13. This is Paul speaking. He says this, Is Christ divided? 
Was Paul crucified for you? I'm sorry, this is the wrong verse. Let's get down to 17. For Christ, verse 17, 1 Corinthians 1, verse 17. For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel. Now notice, what is Paul not doing? But what is he doing? Preaching the gospel. So could baptism be the gospel? If he's, if he's preaching the gospel, but he's not baptizing, could that be a part of it? No, because he's, he's not doing one of those two things. Do you understand what I'm saying? Right. He's saying, I'm doing this, I'm preaching the gospel, but I'm not baptizing the people. <clears throat> so you know what that does? Do you know what that tells you? That baptism is not a part of the gospel. Right. You can Because it says, it says he's doing one. Could you do one without the other? If the gospel was being baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, like people say, if that was the gospel, being baptized, could you preach the gospel and all of that without baptizing people? It wouldn't be possible. But if they're two different things, right, then it makes sense. What is the gospel? It's the death, burial, and resurrection. That's what the gospel is. So notice, and what, now think about this. What did Romans 1 say saved you? Gospel, right? It said that it is the power of God and the salvation. And what was it talking about? For I am not ashamed of the gospel. So what saves you? The gospel. Is the gospel the same as being baptized? No. So does baptism save you? No. Does everyone understand this? The logical steps? It's super clear. There's no way around it. Some people will say this, though. I want you to go to uh, get two, verses, two uh, passages in your hand. Get Titus chapter number 3 in one hand and get Matthew chapter number 3 in the other hand. Some people will say this. Well, it's not a work of the law. This is what I've heard before. And I've heard this by Church of Christ members specifically. But one is Pentecostals will use this as well. They'll say it's not a work of the law. It's a work, work under the New Testament. After, you know, Jesus Christ died on the cross, you know, at that point, <coughs> that's when this was instituted. Well, I want you to look at something here. Look at Titus chapter number 3. Look at verse number 5. Look what the Bible says here. Titus chapter number 3, verse number 5. It says this. Not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us. So what are we not saved by? Works of righteousness. Something that would be considered a righteous work. We're not saved by works of righteousness. Well, I want you to go over to Matthew chapter number 3. Matthew chapter number 3. I'll find that myself if you're already there. Matthew chapter number 3. This is the passage when Jesus goes to John the Baptist to be baptized. And I want you to notice what Jesus calls baptism. Look at Matthew chapter number 3, verse number 13. He says this, or it says this. The Bible reads, Then cometh Jesus from Galilee to Jordan unto John to be baptized of him. But John forbade him, saying, I'm not going to baptize you. And this is what he says. Saying, I have need to be baptized of thee, and comest thou to me? He's saying he's not worthy. Then Jesus says this in verse 15. Pay close attention. And Jesus answering said unto him, Suffer it to be so now, for thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he suffered him. Notice what it said. He said, thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. What's he talking about when he says to fulfill all righteousness? What, what is he referring to? Baptism. So what is baptism? It's a work of righteousness. And what does Titus chapter number 3 verse 5 say? Not by works of righteousness which we have done. And when you stop and you look at this passage in Matthew chapter number 3, what's the reason why he has to fulfill all righteousness? What's the purpose? So he can give us his righteousness. The Bible says in Philippians 3, 9, And be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. When God looks at me, do you know whose righteousness I have? Jesus' righteousness. Amen. So the very baptism that Christ had you know, uh, uh, accomplished upon himself, fulfilled upon himself. Do you know the reason why he did that? Was to make sure, just in case anybody wasn't baptized that believed in him, that he could give them his righteousness. He fulfilled every work that we would need to do. 
Every single work. Right. That's why he fulfilled the, the, the law. That's why he fulfilled all righteousness. So guess what? Just in case somebody's not baptized, just in case someone doesn't go to church and doesn't never reads their Bible, never does those things, does it matter? No, because Christ was baptized for them. Yeah, that's right. Let me give you a perfect example of someone that for sure was not baptized, for sure was not baptized, and Jesus said they were going to heaven. The thief on the cross. Right. The thief on the cross was hanging next to Jesus, and they were speaking to one another. The thief on the cross said to Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. Jesus turned to him and said, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. Right. Amen. You would have to be drunk or high to believe they took this guy down off the cross and baptized him. Right. That is the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard in my life. Guess what? He wasn't baptized. And you know what Jesus said? You're going to be in heaven today with me. Amen. Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. Do you know what the thief on the only, the only thing that the thief on the cross could do? You know what? Let me say this. Do you know what he didn't do? Reform his life. Do you know what he didn't do? Repent of all of his sins. Do you know what the thief on the cross didn't do? He wasn't baptized. He sure wasn't baptized in the name of Jesus. He wasn't baptized at all. No, he did nothing but what? What's the one thing you have? He, the only thing he could do was the one thing you have to do. And that's what? Please. Put your faith on the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. He said, Lord, remember me when thou comest into, my, into thy kingdom. Why would he say that? Because he believed that he was Lord. Amen. And you know what he wanted? He knew he wasn't worthy. He's dying on the beach. Please just remember me. That's all he had to say. All he had to do was just have faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Jesus told him, today shalt thou be with me in paradise. You know who else wasn't baptized? The millions of people that lived before John the Baptist started baptizing. Yeah. The millions of people in the Old Testament right. that lived before John the Baptist. The Bible's clear. And one of the Pentecostals don't even disagree with this. The, the millions of people that lived in the Old Testament, none of them were baptized because John the Baptist was the first person baptized. One does Pentecostal believe that? They agree. He's, he was, he's, you know, John the Baptist was the first person baptized. Well, then you have a major problem. If that's essential to salvation, no one was being baptized in the Old Testament. That means no one was saved, according to them. But do you know how they got to heaven? The same way that you get to heaven. Remember that verse we read that no flesh is justified by the works of the law. That means Old Testament, New Testament, that means anybody who has flesh. If you have flesh, you're not justified by the works of the law. And if we look at the Bible, what does it say in Genesis chapter number 3? What does it tell you in, in uh, or no, I'm sorry, not Genesis chapter number 3, Genesis chapter number 15. What does it tell you about Abraham? It tells you that he believed God and he accounted it to him for righteousness. Same way of salvation always. Old Testament, New Testament, it doesn't matter. Do you know how the thief on the cross was saved? Same way that Abraham was saved. Amen. Do you know how Abraham was saved? Same way that everybody was saved. David was saved. Everyone. Right. One way of salvation. There's always been one way of salvation. It's always been the same. It's faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. So we're not saved by works. We're not saved by water baptism. Repentance means to just change your mind. That's all that it means. And the only repentance that's required for salvation is a repentance of mind from unbelief to belief. The, the phrase repent of your sins is never found in the Bible one time. We're not saved by our own works. We're not saved by our own righteousness. Real quickly, I want to look at three verses here. That prove eternal security because another thing that they deny, of course, is eternal security. They believe that you can lose your salvation. I want you to go to uh, John chapter number 10, verse number 28. The clearest verse in the entire Bible. The teaching that you can never lose your salvation. And of course, they try to refute this verse and they have a ridiculous response to this verse. It's John chapter number 10, verse number 28. But let me say this as well. The only way that you have grace... The only way that you are saved by grace is if you believe in eternal security. Right. Because ultimately what it comes down to when someone is rejecting the eternal security of the believer is because they're trusting in their own works. What's the reason why they think they're losing their salvation? Always, what is the reason? Because they believe that they've sinned. So what do they have to do? Who are they depending on to get to heaven? Themselves. Themselves. That's it. They believe that they have to be a good enough person. Ultimately, in the end of a person's life that thinks that they had to keep their own salvation, who was it that got them to heaven? Themselves. There's no way around that. 
It was their own righteousness. It was themselves. It's not faith. It has nothing to do with faith. And without the eternal security of the believer, without assurance of salvation, once saved, always saved, you don't have grace. So they can say grace all they want, but you have to. In order to believe, in order to understand and believe that salvation is by grace and through faith only like the Bible teaches, you have to believe in eternal security. John 10, 28, the Bible says, and I give unto them eternal life. So how long is it? Forever. It's never ending, right? I give unto them eternal life and they shall never perish. Will they, will they ever be able to go to hell? Will they ever be able to perish? They shall never perish. I'm giving them eternal life, and the result is that they'll never perish. And then just to make sure that he's not misunderstood, he says this. Just in case you thought that you could lose your salvation, maybe just in case you weren't positive, he says this. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. Notice that. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. What's the point of what he's saying? He's giving you an analogy that you're in my hand, and you're safe, and you're saved in my hand forever. You have eternal life and you'll never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. What's his point? Nothing can change that. Once you're saved, you're always saved. Once you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, you've fulfilled the one requirement in order to go to heaven. And it's a done deal. You're already, remember, at the moment that you believe in Jesus, you are passed from death unto life. Is there anything else that needs to be done? No. You're passed from death unto life. So what do you have right then? You're in life. What do you have? You have eternal life. How long is eternal? Forever. It's everlasting. Can you ever lose it? If you lost it, it wasn't eternal, right? If I said, hey, I'm going to come to your house and put in an everlasting light bulb outside, how long does that light bulb have? All you have to do is believe in me. How long does it have to last? Because what did I say? Be there forever, right? If it, and let's say it went out one day. Would, would I be telling the truth then when I told you it was an everlasting light bulb? I wouldn't. So how long does your, etern how long does your life have to last? Forever. Forever. You're going to die and you're going to go away. Heaven. Go to go flip over to John 11 now. Just one page over. John chapter number 11. John chapter number 11. John chapter number 11. I want you to look at verse number 25. John 11 verse 25. Look at what Jesus says here. Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. Now look at verse 26. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Notice that. You'll never die if you believe in Jesus. If you put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, you're already passed from death unto life. At the moment of physical death, your soul will go to heaven. So we're referring to the fact that you'll never go to hell and experience the second death because your body will, will be resurrected. You will, you will pass away on this earth, but you will go to heaven and live forever in heaven. You'll have eternal life, everlasting life. You'll never die. Jesus could not be any clearer. What a lot of Pentecostals will say about John 10, 28... When the whole point is that you can never lose your salvation, and he says, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand, they'll tell you, and I just had a guy tell me this like three or four days ago. They'll tell you, yeah, nobody can pluck you out of, out of his hand, but you can jump out of his hand. That is so ridiculous. Number one, neither shall any man pluck you out of, out of my hand. That's, he, he's giving you an analogy to explain to you that you will never lose your salvation, that you're safe in his hand, neither shall any man. The whole point, what is he saying? I mean, come on, neither shall any man pluck you out of my hand. Saying you're going to be in my hand forever. And you know what? It doesn't matter what analogy he would have used. They would have tried to twist whatever he said to try to make it say the opposite. It doesn't matter what analogy he would have said. He could have said, you know, that, 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 you know, that you're already in heaven or something like that. And they would have said, well, you could, you could jump out of heaven. You could leave heaven. They would have said whatever. If, since he used the word pluck, notice they never use pluck. Think about that. Because he said, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. They would never say, well, you can pluck yourself out of his hand. It's like, what in the world? You're a man in the first place. Are you a man? He's talking about mankind. So if you're a man, what did he just say couldn't happen? No man can pluck him out of his hand. And then he goes on to explain how strong he is and how strong his father is. He's trying to say, you're not coming out of my hand. Right. Eternal security, understanding that once you're saved, you're always saved, is a precedent to be saved. You have to understand that once you're saved, you're always saved, because ultimately what it comes down to is you are not trusting fully in the Lord Jesus Christ. You're trusting in yourself to get you to heaven. If you think you can lose your salvation, it's because you think that you weren't good enough. So what were you trusting in? 
being good enough. If I ask a, a one that's Pentecostal who believes that he could lose his salvation, if he's ever lost his salvation and he told me no, what would be the reason why he had never lost his salvation? Because he thought he was righteous enough in order to keep it. Was it based on Jesus? Was he trusting in Jesus? No. He was trusting in his own righteousness and his own works. And that's why a sermon like this needs to be preached. Because, number one, I hope someone sees this. I normally don't refer to, you know, the video or anything like that. But I hope that there are oneness Pentecostals that see this. And we love them. And we don't want them to, you know, people have this attitude. They just want anybody who doesn't believe like them to go to hell. That's horrible and that's wicked. Right. That's evil. Right. When you just want anybody who doesn't believe the truth to go to hell. You had to be taught the truth at one time, too. Right. I'm sure glad the person that gave me the gospel didn't think that way. Amen. 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 I'm sure glad when I was a young boy at, you know, 11 years old, just about to be 12 years old, that somebody took the time and showed me the gospel. It wasn't just, oh, I'm saved. He doesn't know how to be, he doesn't know how to be saved. Well, I'm just not going to show him. Yeah. There's so many people that are in these false religions, and we need, what we need to do is, is preach to them the true gospel. Right. They need to be shown clearly. You know what you need to do is not hate them. You need to sharpen up your skills on the Bible. Remember the verses that we looked at this morning. And when you approach them, they start talking about this. And they start giving you these answers, you know where to turn them in the Bible to refute what they're saying. Amen. And you know what will happen is the Word of God will work on their hearts. The Word of God is quick. The Bible says it's alive. It's, it's, it's powerful. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. And the Bible teaches that by the Word of God comes faith. So what's going to happen is they're going to hear the Word of God and then they're going to, they, they can put their faith in the Word of God. What did Jesus say? He that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me. It comes by hearing the word of God. So you need to know the Bible well enough. You need to care for them. Prepare yourself. And when you knock on a one that's Pentecostal's door in order to show them how to go to heaven, be prepared to show them, you know, all the verses that we looked at this morning. Be prepared to show and, and be prepared the, the you know, the false uh, beliefs that they have to tear those things down and show them, hey, this isn't, that's not what the Bible teaches. Look at this verse. We're saved by grace through faith alone. We're not saved by work. We're saved forever once we're saved. Jesus said no man would pluck him out of his hand. What's he trying to say? And explain to them. You're just, you know, it doesn't matter what analogy would have, you would have used. It doesn't matter what analogy he would have brought up. You would have said something different. What are they trying to get around? Jesus' words. What do they not believe? Jesus' words. Oneness Pentecostalism, and this is true. Oneness Pentecostalism is a cult. Oneness Pentecostalism is very different even than the majority of Pentecostals. Right. They are very specific in what you have to do to get to heaven. They are very loud and open about it. They are very clear. And they say that the only people that are going to heaven are those who are part of this branch that started in 1913-1914 time period. Because you have to be baptized, they say, in the name of the Lord Jesus. The name of the Lord Jesus. So they say, anyone that's not baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus, anyone who's not speaking in tongues... Anyone who's not reformed their life, which they are the only group that believes and does all these things, right? And they're not reforming their life. They think they are. They think that they've stopped sinning. They say those people are not saved. It's literally just this one group. That's the definition of a cult, my friend. When you say we're the only ones that are saved and nobody else is saved, that is a cult. That is the definition of a cult. You know what this Pentecostalism is? It's a cult. Right. It's a cult. You know what you never see them doing? Going out and telling other people about what they believe. If you thought that you were the only ones right and the world was going to hell, why aren't you out telling people about what you believe? Right. Why aren't you out knocking people's doors? Right. Why aren't you out there spreading out and spreading this message of truth, of the true gospel? Because they're a cult. Right. They do the same things that a lot, all the other cults do. I want you to, uh, I want to we're going to change gears here. We're going to talk about speaking in tongues. It's going to be the last portion and, uh, of, uh, of the sermon. And this is going to be the most important part of the sermon. I want to focus on this for quite a while. Now I want you to go to Acts chapter number 2. <clears throat> now what is the name of the group we're preaching against this morning? Or I'm preaching against? Oneness Pentecostalism. So where, where do they get their name? Pentecostalism. They get it. From the day of Pentecost. That is the day of Pentecost that is recorded in Acts chapter number 2. Acts chapter number 2. This is the day that they put all the emphasis on. This is the chapter that they put all the emphasis on. This is what they say. What, what they believe in their group and who they are. They say that they, can, they stand back to Acts chapter number 2. That this is their forefathers. The things that they stand for. The things that they believe. They say go to Acts chapter number 2. That is the day of Pentecost. Right? Now, let me say this. Just like they say you've got to repent of your sins, and that phrase is never found in the Bible, 
Do you know what they say you have to do to be saved? Speak in tongues. You know what else is not found in the Bible? The phrase, speak in tongues, or speaking in tongues. It's not found one time in the entire Bible. And you know why? Because it's the same exact misunderstanding. Because they do not understand the word tongues. They misdefine the word tongues. Why? You know, what does the word repent mean? Change your mind. So they misunderstood that word, didn't they? Just like many people that say repent of your sins, right? That's not only Pentecostals. Many people that say well, you got to repent of your sins, they're, they're you know, misdefining the word repent. Well, the same thing happens here when we start talking about tongues. What they're doing is they are misdefining, they're misunderstanding the word tongues in the Bible. I want you to look here in Acts chapter number 2. We're going to begin reading in verse number 1. Acts chapter number 2, look at verse number 1. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. So notice this is the day of Pentecost. Verse 2, And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire, and it sat upon each of them. So it said, appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire, and it sat upon each of them. Now look at verse 4. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. Look at next. And began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. So notice the Holy Spirit comes upon them and they begin to speak in tongues. Is that what it says? Are they speaking in tongues? Is that what it says? No. It says they began to speak with other tongues. What does other mean? Tongues other than what they normally speak. The word tongue in the Bible means language. I'm going to prove that to you from this passage. Look at verse number 5. And there were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, devout men out of every nation under heaven. And when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded. That means they were confused. Now watch. Because that every man heard them speak in his own language. So what did they hear? They heard him speak in his own language. All of these Jews, they're dwelling there temporarily. They're not from Jerusalem. They're actually foreigners, and they came there to visit, and they're from other nations. So what do they do? Do they speak the, do they speak the Hebrew tongue? No, they speak. They probably speak that as well, but they speak primarily an other tongue, an, another tongue other than the Hebrew tongue. That's why it says they began to speak with other tongues other than their primary tongue. What are they speaking? They're speaking all of these other languages, other tongues, other languages, other than the Hebrew tongue, or other than that which is spoken primarily in Jerusalem. Look at verse 7. Let's look at this again. So notice, I want, first I want to focus on the uh, last part of verse 6. Remember that, what it says there, that they heard them speak in his own language. All of these people, they heard him speak in their own language. Look at verse 7. <clears throat> and they were all amazed and marveled, saying one to another, Behold, are not all these which speak Galileans? So why are they surprised? Because they're, they're, they're Galileans, but they're not only speaking the primary language of Galilee. They're speaking all these other languages, right? Look at verse 8. Look at the, the very clear verse. Look what it says. And how here we speak every man in our own tongue. Look at the, again at verse 6. Let's compare these two. What did it say? That every man heard them speak in his own language. What does it say at the end of verse 8? Or the beginning of verse 8, and how hear we every man in our own tongue. What is it using interchangeable? <laughs> tongue and language. You know what the word tongue means? Language. That's all that it means. A legitimate, bona fide language that these men spoke. Right. They're Galileans. They don't speak my language. How, all of a sudden, when the Holy Spirit came upon them, how are these men able to speak my language? A legitimate language. Right. Now, the modern movement of tongues, are they speaking a, a legitimate language? No. What are they doing? Just random pieces of, of, everybody knows what I'm referring to, they're random pieces of bits, and they're just blah, 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 blah right? Yeah. They're just, their mouth is going everywhere, they're just making random sounds. Right. Is it a real language? No. Are they doing what they're doing here at the day of Pentecost? No. They're not. They're not, it's totally different, and they call themselves Pentecostals. Why? They say the day of Pentecost, right? Well, is what they're doing the same as this? No. No. It's not at all. And you say, well, how do you know that these are actual languages? Verse 8, one more time. And how hear we every man in our own, uh, in our own tongue wherein we were born? Look at this. 
Parthians and Medes and Elamites and the dwellers of Mesopotamia and Judea and Cappadocia and Pontus and Asia and Phrygia and Pamphylia and Egypt and in the parts of Libya and Cyrene and strangers of Rome, Jews, proselytes, Cretes, and Arabians, we do hear them speak in our own tongues the wonderful works of God. He named 17 legitimate languages all throughout the earth. It is not random sounds. It is not gibberish. It is not ridiculousness. It is real languages. Wow. They are speaking actual, literal languages. Amen. And this is why we started off in Proverbs chapter number 25. Because do you know what they tell you is the evidence of salvation? Speaking, speaking in tongues. Speaking in tongues, my friend, is never found in the Bible. That phrase, one time. And do you know what else is never found in the Bible? A person falling on the ground, you know, making ridiculous sounds, foaming at their mouth, and, and, and acting and pretending like they're speaking in a legitimate language. Right. Right. When the Holy Ghost comes upon a person, they don't act like an idiot. Right. They don't fall on the ground and roll. They don't just mumble and make sounds that, that don't even assemble real words or real thoughts or ideas, do you know what they do? They speak in a real language. They, they perform a real miracle. A real miracle. Do you know what it is? Speaking in a language so that other people can hear them and they understand what they're saying. Notice everyone understands this. Have you ever heard anybody at a Pentecostal church speak in tongues? Yes. Can you interpret it for me? No. And no one else can either. You know why? Because they're just making a bunch of sounds. Do you know what they have? They're, you know what they're doing? They're boasting themselves of a false gift. Right, right. They're boasting themselves of a false gift is what they're doing. And that is their determining factor of salvation. That is their determining factor of salvation. And they say, if you can't do this, then you're not saved. How wicked when they're really the one that's pretending and faking. And, and you know what? The only time you hear a person, because they say when they start speaking in tongues, people have said they black out. And sometimes it sounds weird. It's not biblical because it's not a real language. It sounds strange and weird sometimes, doesn't it? You know the only time you see somebody speaking in the Bible where they can't control what's coming out of their mouth and they're speaking with a tongue or a voice that's not themselves? When a person's devil-possessed. Right. right. That's the only time you ever hear somebody speaking with another, another tongue that's not their own where they can't control it. The Bible actually says, we're going to look at this exact verse in a minute, 1 Corinthians 14. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 14 that the Spirit, speaking about speaking with other tongues, it says that the Spirit of the prophets is subject to the prophets. You know what that means? That my Spirit is subject to myself. I choose what I do and what I say. Why in the world are these Pentecostals not able to control what's coming out of their mouth then? Why? It's not lining up with the Bible. It's obviously not the Holy Spirit. So what Spirit is it? Obviously a spirit that they can't put into subjection. Do you know what it means to be devil-possessed? It means something else has possessed or put you in subjection. Right, right. That's scary. Amen. If you're blacking out and you don't know what you're saying and you don't know what you're doing, the only other time that happens in the Bible is when somebody's devil-possessed. Right. A spirit is coming upon them. Right. I'm not saying it's always devil-possession, but I'm saying it's sometimes devil-possession. I'm saying that the modern movement of tongues is never true it's never biblical. It's never right. They are never doing what's mentioned here. Right. And sometimes even, it's devil possession. Right. That's scary. Right. You take them to Acts 2, and you show them Acts 2, and you see these are legitimate languages. Why are you not speaking in real languages? Why are you mumbling and you sounding ridiculous? It's not a real language. And, and it's, it's where they get their name. But they always say, well, <coughs> I realize... First, they, they try to get around this. They try to quote this, then you take them to it, and then you stump them. Then they say, well, we're speaking in a heavenly language. You need to go to 1 Corinthians 14. So you know what we're going to do? We're going to go to 1 Corinthians 14 as well. But that's, that's a lie, is what that is. Because what's their name again? Pentecostals. Pentecostals. They name themselves Pentecostals based upon when? The day of Pentecost. So their main charisma, their main gift is what? They always bring up speaking in tongues. And they're called Pentecostals. Where do they get their name? From the day of Pentecost. What do they think they're doing? And what particular event do they think that they're lining up with in order to call them Pentecostals? The day of Pentecost. Right. So they're a sham from the beginning. Mm -hmm. The group is a sham from the beginning. Once you look at 1 Corinthians 14. And we're to go through 1 Corinthians 14. 
In just a moment, I don't want to go on too long, but we're going to go through this chapter. But I want to read to you, uh, real quick, I want to read to you every time the word tongue is used in the Bible. I'm going to go through it fast. I don't want you to turn there because I, to, I don't want to waste time. Every time it's either referring to the tongue that is in your mouth, the member that, that uh, you know, allows you to enunciate, make sound, and communicate, right? Or it's referring to a language, just like we saw. Genesis 10, 31. These are the sons of Shem after their families, after their tongues. In their lands, after their nations. That means after their languages, right? Just because different nations speak, different nations speak different languages. Keep that in mind. <clears throat> Psalm thirty-one twenty: Thou shalt hide them in the secret of thy presence from the pride of man. Thou shalt keep them secretly in a pavilion from the strife of tongues, saying that it causes strife. The tongue in your mouth. Destroy. Uh, uh, Psalm fifty-five verse nine: Destroy, O Lord, and divide their tongues. For I have seen violence and strife in the city. Psalm 78, verse 36. Nevertheless, they did flatter him with their mouth, and they lied unto him with their tongues. Notice, every time. They have sharpened their tongues like a serpent. A serpent has a, a pointy tongue. Adder's poison is under their lips. Selah. Uh, <clears throat> Isaiah 66, 18. For I know their works and their thoughts. It shall come that I will gather all nations and tongues. Notice the nations and the tongues, because the nations speak different tongues. I'm doing this just to put this to rest without a shadow of a doubt that every single time the word tongues is used in the Bible, it means languages or it means the member in your mouth. Every time. So when we're done and we end this sermon, there is no possibility that this movement is biblical. That's why I'm doing this. So I, know, I realize I'm taking time, but, but listen and pay close attention. Try what I'm saying. Make sure that I'm telling you the truth. Jeremiah chapter 9 verse 3, And they bend their tongues like a bow for lies. Jeremiah 23, 31, Behold, I am the prophets. I am against the prophets, saith the Lord, that use their tongues and say, He saith, saying they're lying. Mark 16, 17, And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils. Now watch this. This is Mark 16, 17. They shall speak with new tongues. What happened in, in uh, Acts 2? What did they do? They spoke with New tongues. They spoke with new languages. Did those men speak those languages before? They didn't. That's why everyone was amazed, wasn't it? How in the world are they doing this? It's a miracle. That's why. They're speaking with new tongues, right? Acts 2, 3, we saw this. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire. We saw Acts 2, 11. And then Acts 10, 46, it says, For they heard them speak with tongues. What does that mean? With languages. And magnify God. Then answer Peter. And when Paul had laid his hands upon them, the Holy Ghost came on them, and they spake with tongues and prophesied. It's the same exact phrase, speaking with tongues, that was used in Acts 2. And what, what did speak with tongues mean in Acts 2? You can clearly define it. It means speak with languages. So every time in the Bible we see that phrase, speak with tongues, what does it mean? Speak with languages. And then we have uh, Romans 3.13, uh, or Acts 19.6, I'm sorry. When Paul had laid his hands upon them, the Holy Ghost came on them, and they spake with tongues and prophesied. <clears throat> I read that actually. Romans 3.13, their heart is an open sepulcher. Their throat, I'm sorry, is an open sepulcher. With their tongues, they have used deceit. So their tongues. 1 Corinthians 12.10, the, the, to another, the working of miracles. To another, prophesy. To another, discerning of spirits. To another, diverse kinds of tongues. You notice that? To another, diverse kinds of tongues. Diverse, it's saying different types of tongues. What is it saying? Different types of languages. This is a gift. And someone's able to speak multiple languages, different types of languages, right? That's the gift. To another, the interpretation of tongues. So what's he doing? He's interpreting languages. This is a gift. That, every gift in the Bible, there's never some weird gift that just like is not, you know, something that we already don't do in life. All the gifts of the Spirit are just gifts of like wisdom. Just gifts of making things. You know, uh, there was certain men in the Old Testament when they were building the tabernacle that had the, the gift of workmanship. It's a real skill that you can work hard at and, and acquire, you know, obviously not to the same degree that you would be able to do this with the Holy Spirit. God would be able to do it, you know, in a miracle, right? But this is a real gift that you could just work hard at and acquire, uh, you know, good skills through workmanship, right? Well, guess what the gift of tongues is? It's a real skill that you can work at and acquire and you can learn languages, but God will sometimes come upon them with the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament or in the New Testament, the book of Acts. And upon the apostles, and he would allow them to be able to speak with these languages and with these tongues, which means languages, of course, as a miracle. You know, uh, it would be a miracle. <clears throat> so then we see, 
Uh, 1 Corinthians uh, 12, 28, it says at the end, you know, diversities of tongues. So different types of tongues. I'm trying to hurry through here. Have all the gifts of healing. Do all speak with tongues? Do all interpret? 1 Corinthians 13, 1. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity, I am become a sounding brass or a tinkling single. So, symbol. So I want you to keep in mind, every time we see the word tongues, what does it mean? Language. So when we see here in 1 Corinthians 13, 1, it says, though I speak with the tongues, what's that mean? Language. The tongues, the language of men and of angels, and have not charity. I have become a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. Is there any compelling reason to think that the definition of tongue just changed all of a sudden we got to 1 Corinthians 13? No, of course not. It's the language or the tongue of men and the, and the language or the tongue of, a, of an angel, right? It's all that it means. And when you look at it in context, specifically, he's talking about that he, he's speaking something that sounds beautiful. That's why he mentions angel like a very spiritual or beautiful sounding language. You know, uh, 1 Corinthians 13, 8, charity never faileth, but whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, that's being able to speak different languages, that gift, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. So that brings us to 1 Corinthians 14, the last mentions of the word tongue are in 1 Corinthians 14. So I want to go through this chapter very quickly because I don't want to uh, take up everyone's afternoon too much. 1 Corinthians 14, look at verse 1. Follow after charity and desire spiritual gifts, but rather that he may prophesy. Look at verse 2. For he that speaketh in an unknown tongue speaketh not unto men, but unto God. For, look at this, no man understandeth him how be it in the spirit, he speaketh mysteries. Now, verse 2, I want to break this down real quick, what this is actually explaining. So what is tongue? It's language. So what would be an unknown language? Notice it said, for, for men there, for no man understands it. Why do they not understand it? Because it's an unknown language to this man, isn't it? If you just started speaking in, in uh, Russian, you know, that's an unknown language to me. I'm gonna, you know what? You're, you're, I'm not gonna be able to understand anything that you're saying. If you start speaking in, you know, some language that's very obscure, you know, if you start, hey, let me be honest, okay? If you start speaking in anything other than English, I'm not gonna understand it very well. I could maybe try to assemble some Spanish, but that's my extent, right? I might be able to know the topic, but I'm not gonna be able to hear every, every, you know, statement that you're saying. You know what it's gonna be? It's gonna be an unknown tongue to me. That's what it's gonna be. It's gonna be an unknown language to me, and I, as a man, I'm not gonna be able to understand you. That's what verse 2 is explaining. Look at verse 3. And this, this whole chapter defies the modern movement of tongues. Look at verse 3, what the concept of the first few verses is saying. But he that's prophesied, now prophesied just means to preach. People don't understand that word very well either. It just means just, what I'm doing right now is I'm prophesying. It doesn't mean to just foretell a future event. It just means to preach. So, but he that prophesieth speaketh unto men to edification, saying it helps you or it builds you up and exhortation and comfort. Verse 4, he that speaketh in an unknown tongue, so a man that speaks in a language that no one understands, edifieth himself. So does he understand what he's saying? Well, he does because he said that he edifies himself. If I stood up here and I started speaking in a language that no one was familiar with, German, does anyone speak German? If I stood up here and just started preaching, you do? Okay, well, a language other than anyone speaks in here, right? If I just stood up here and just started speaking just a random language, right? You know, whatever it may be that no one's spoken here. Am I going to edify you? Am I going to help you and comfort you and exhort you? No, because you don't have a clue what I'm saying. But when I'm preaching sometimes, I'm not going to lie to you, I edify myself. The reason why I'm yelling is because I'm excited, right? Man. You know the only person if I was speaking in a language that nobody understood in here but myself? You know the only person that would be edified? Me. That's it. You wouldn't be edified at all. You know why? Because you have no idea what I'm saying. Now, that alone debunks the new modern movement of tongues, the, the, the false movement of tongues. You know why? Because no one ever understands what they're saying. And Paul is actually admonishing them, don't stand up and just speak a language that no one understands because the only person you're going to be edifying is yourself. And even worse in their case, because they're not even speaking a legitimate language, they're not even edifying themselves. Right. Think about that. They're not even making themselves, they're not even building themselves up because if you ask them what they're saying, they, have, they say they have no clue. They have no idea. No clue. That's why they need somebody else to interpret for them and that person's just a part of the, a long part of the lie and stuff because they're just making stuff up. He said this, he said that, he said this. 
You know, they don't have a clue. Neither one of them. They're both fraudulent. They're both lying. Right. It's not biblical. Right. Amen. Look at verse number four. He that speaketh in an unknown tongue edifieth himself, but he that prophesieth, like a person that's preaching in the tongue that you understand, edifieth the church, saying the congregation. Verse 5, I would that ye all spake with tongues, but rather that ye prophesied. Is that the attitude of the modern movement of tongues? Do they say that just preaching and making sure everyone understands what's being preached is the most important thing? No. No. What's, what's the most important thing to them? Speaking in tongues. Speaking in tongues. And what they believe, keep in mind, is not even what Paul is speaking about. It's, it's not the speaking with tongues in the Bible. I'm going to clearly show you this in just a moment. But I would that ye all spake with tongues, but <laughs> rather that ye prophesied. Look at this. For greater is he that prophesieth than he that speaketh with tongues. Except he interpret, because then you know what he would be doing? He'd be prophesying as well. When he's saying prophesying there, he's saying preaching where people understand it. Then he's saying, I'd rather you prophesy where people would understand it than you would just speak with an unknown tongue where no one understands it. Unless you're going to have someone interpret, well, then everyone's going to understand, right? <clears throat> he says that the church may receive edifying. Verse 6, now, brethren, if I come unto you speaking with tongues, what shall I profit you? Except I shall speak to you either by revelation or by knowledge or by prophesying or by doctrine. Something that you understood, but not in another language. He could do those things in another language that they don't understand, but it's not going to edify them. So he's saying what I need to do, what I should do, and what would be edifying to you, is if I just came and spoke your language, and I, pre and I preached to you revelations, things that you hadn't heard before, knowledge, you know, the, the prophesying, or doctrine, right? Look at verse 7. <laughs> And even things without life, giving sound. And he says, he gives you examples, whether pipe or harp, because these, these things are not alive, right? But they, they make a sound, but they don't have life. And then he says this, except they give a distinction in the sounds, how shall it know, be known what is pipe or harp? A distinction in the sound is a, a specific sound, a very specific sound that means something, right? Uh, I'll tell you what he's talking about if you look at verse 8. For if the trumpet give an uncertain sound, saying this is not a distinction in the sound, this is an uncertain sound, who shall prepare himself to battle? I think a good example of this is a lot of times when a, a war is breaking out and people are being invaded, they'll use a trumpet. And there's a certain type of alarm, right? However it may be. You know, I'm not going to give you an example of that, but however that sound may, may be, everyone is aware that that sound is the sound that is distinctive. It's a certain sound for a war. And what do they do? They get up and they get ready because they can understand the sound. Right? They understand that sound and they know what it means. Just like when we speak words, it just represents, the words represent a thought. You know what the, the, that, that sound represents? It represents war. Right? Well, words, when I make sounds, I'm just making sounds that are ultimately representing a thought. I'm assembling together sounds that ultimately represent a thought that I can convey to you. Well, the same thing works with like a trumpet. Right? So he's saying you need to be able to understand the sounds that you make. Look at verse 9. So likewise ye, so in the same way ye, except ye utter by the tongue words easy to be understood, how shall it be known what is spoken? For ye shall speak into the air. What's his whole point? Don't just speak something or say something where no one understands you. It's the exact opposite of the modern tongue Pentecostal movement. Verse 10, there are, it may be, so many kinds of voices in the world, and none of them is without signification. Verse 11, therefore if I know not the meaning of the voice, I shall be unto, unto him that speaketh a barbarian, and he that speaketh shall be a barbarian unto me. So when someone is speaking and you're not understanding them, what are they are? What are they unto you? You look at them like a barbarian. Like I don't know what you're saying. You're a barbarian to me, right? Do you know what Pentecostals are like? A bunch of barbarians. And it's even worse because a barbarian is at least speaking a real language. They're just getting up there and just, blah, 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 just moving their tongue around, making all kinds of sounds that means nothing. That's helping no one. It's foolishness. You know what it is? It's self righteousness. Right. It's a false gift that they boast about and say, hey, this is the proof of my salvation when it's a lie in the first place. Right. 
they're lying in the first place. So notice there'll be a barbarian under them because they, <coughs> they don't understand it. But this is someone speaking an actual language. Verse 12, even so ye, for as much as ye are zealous of spiritual gifts, seek that ye may excel to the edifying of the church. So notice, they're zealous of spiritual gifts, but they're misguided even. He's like, that's not the most important thing is just having a gift and not helping someone else. The most important thing is helping someone else. You know what precedes chapter 14? Chapter 13. You know what it's about? Charity. Helping other people. That's why he went into that first, and then he starts explaining chapter 14 that you're wasting time you know, speaking in other languages and not helping other people because the most important thing is helping someone else. Look at verse 13. Wherefore, let him that speaketh in an unknown tongue pray that he may interpret so that he would be able to interpret as well. He's saying don't speak in these tongues unless you have an interpreter. For if I pray in an unknown tongue, he's saying my spirit prays, saying I'm praying, right? His spirit is, is Paul, right? We've went over this before in his sermons. He's saying I'm praying, but my understanding is unfruitful. So what's he mean by that? He's saying, when he says my understanding, he's talking about the people that hear him. He's saying the people that are, that are here. What's the whole topic before this talking about? The whole chapter. Making sure people understand what you're saying. Make a distinction in the sound. Make a certain sound. Say things that people can understand. Don't speak in a tongue where people don't understand you. But if, if, but if you do, what happens? You understand. You edify yourself. But other people aren't understanding you. So when he says my understanding, he's not talking about how he understands it. He's saying the way that people understand me. Saying that my understanding is unfruitful because people aren't able to understand it. They're not bringing forth fruit. They're, he's not able to edify them. And I'm going to prove that to you. Look at what, that, what it says next in verse 15. What is it then? I pray with the Spirit, and I will pray with the understanding also. Saying he's going to pray in, in a tongue, or he's going to speak in a tongue where others can understand him also. I will sing with the Spirit, and I will sing with the understanding also. Saying he's going to sing in a language in front of people that can understand him. Verse 16, this is the proof of that. Else, when thou shalt bless with the Spirit, saying when he's praying and then he blesses everyone, how shall he that occupieth the room of the unlearned, that's the person that doesn't speak the language that he's speaking, the unlearned say amen at thy giving of thanks. So who's the person that's not understanding what he's saying? Himself? No. It's the person that's listening to him. Because they're not able to say amen when he gives thanks. He's saying, if I stood up here and I started praying in a language that you don't understand, I'm edifying myself, but the way that I'm understood is not good. It's unfruitful because no one understands me. So when I start praying, how am I going to help you and how are you even going to say amen when I give thanks? So when I give thanks to God, like praise God for this, that, and I'm praying, right? Sound like a Pentecostal for a minute there. I'm praising God, right? How are you going to say amen? Because he, what he's saying is you don't understand. So who's the person not understanding? Right. And you know what Pentecostals say? Well, I don't even know what I'm saying. Well, Paul understood what he was saying. There's never a time in the Bible when somebody doesn't know what they're saying. Let's get through here real quick. Look at uh, verse 17. For, they, for thou verily givest thanks well, but the other's not edified. Notice that word edified again. They don't understand, saying you're edified because you understand. Going back to uh, earlier in the chapter, it was verse 4, if you cross-reference those later. Uh, verse 18, I thank my God, I speak with tongues more than ye all. What's he saying? I speak with more languages than everyone. You know why? Because Paul was the one that gave the gospel to the entire world. Did everyone speak the same language as Paul? No. And actually, in the Bible, Paul is recorded being able to speak two languages, maybe three even. When he stands up and he speaks to the Romans in Greece, in Greece, and then he also, after that, it'd be Greek. And then also after that, he speaks to the Hebrews. Right? Almost within a few minutes of one another. And they're surprised. Right? And they ask him, are you a Roman? Why? Because he speaks multiple languages. Paul's a very educated man. And you know what he did? He traveled around everywhere. And guess what? They didn't all speak the same language. You know what he had to do? Learn multiple languages. So he said, I thank God that I'm able to speak in multiple languages. More than any of you. I know more languages than all of you. So he's saying it's a great thing to be able to speak in multiple languages. Verse 19, yet, say, even though in the church I had rather speak five words with my understanding. He's saying, when I go to church and I preach, I would rather not speak in all those other languages. Even though I'm happy I can do that, I'd rather only say five words to you and you understand it. That by my voice I might teach <laughs> others also. Then 10,000 words 
in an unknown tongue. Paul's actually preaching a real language. And he's saying, even though I preach all these other languages, I would rather come and preach to you and only get up behind this pulpit and say five words and you understand it. Then get up, get up here and say 10,000 words in an unknown tongue. What would be more edifying for you today? If I stood up here and just said, gave you a five-word sermon, or if I stood up here, and it might feel, feel it's, it's starting to feel like I'm doing this because how long the sermon is this morning, but I come up here and preach a 10,000-word sermon. Which one's better? The five-word. Why? Because at, at least you can understand it. That's the point. At least you get it. Look at verse... <coughs> Look at verse 20. Brethren, be not children in understanding. How be it in malice be ye children, but in understanding be men. Verse 21. In the law it is written, with men of other tongues and other lips will I speak unto this people. Now this is super key. We're going to read this real quick. We're going to look this verse up, what's being quoted. We're going to come back and read like four or five more verses in this chapter and we'll be done for this morning. I want you to turn, keep your hand here, but I want you to turn to Isaiah chapter number 28, verse number 11. Keep your hand here. Isaiah chapter number 28, verse number 11. Now, this is extremely key. And the reason why is he just quoted a verse. He's talking about tongues, and he just quoted a verse about tongues, didn't he? Right? So, he's speaking about tongues. And what does tongue, tongues mean? Language. Languages, okay? So, when we look this, this verse up, here in just a moment, what would it make sense that this verse is about? Other languages, right? Just speaking about other languages, right? That's a way to prove that this context in 1 Corinthians 14 is talking about a specific language, speaking with another language. Look at Psalm chapter number 28. Look at verse number 11. For with stammering lips and another tongue, watch this, will he speak to this people. Right here when he makes this statement, for with stammering lips, and he says this, and another tongue will he speak to this people? He's preaching about Isaiah. We don't have time to go into all this. But he's preaching about Isaiah coming. And Isaiah coming and preaching the word of God. And he's going to be preaching another what? Language wherein they do not understand it. And they are not able to understand what specific language this is. Now the way to debunk the one that's been a con without even proving that this is talking about another language, which you can do that in scripture and comparing verses with verses, we don't have time, is this. The oneness Pentecostal movement believes that the first time someone spoke with tongues was on the day of Pentecost. But this is saying that Isaiah spake with another tongue. So what was he doing? Speaking with another language, right? But I thought it didn't start with until Acts 2. Then you look in 1 Corinthians 14 when it's talking about speaking with other tongues. And the same type of tongue that he's talking about is the same type of tongue that Isaiah spoke with to another nation. Or to another tongue to that nation. And what was it? It's a different language. So notice in context even, you look up a verse when it's quoted about speaking another tongue. It's about another language. I want you to skip down. Now, this right here alone is, is the worst part of all of it. Of the oneness Pentecostal movement. I want you to skip to verse number 27. Verse number 27. It gives you rules. Rules to follow when speaking with tongues in the church. Look at verse 27. If any man speak in an unknown tongue, let it be by two or three. So he's saying in a service when we gather together, it should only be two or three preaching. Two or three people preaching that speak in an unknown tongue. The same tongue, but only two of them should preach. Has anybody seen a, a, a Pentecostal or oneness Pentecostal church when they're speaking in tongues? Number one, they're not speaking. Keep in mind, it's not what this is talking about in the first place. It's not a legitimate language, but is there only two or three of them doing it? Every single person almost in those churches are doing it. So what are they doing? They're violating one of the laws right here even. So even with it, they're not even, what they're doing is not even what Paul's talking about. They're not even speaking with a legitimate tongue. But even when it comes to following the rules, they're not doing so. It says in that by course that it says, and let one interpret. Do they always have an interpreter? No. no. They couldn't interpret in the first place. It's not a real language. Verse 28, but if there be no interpreter, let him keep silence in the church and let him speak to himself and to God. Notice that he's speaking to himself.
himself into God saying he's praying. He's not even speaking out loud. If you don't speak another language, it wouldn't be best to put some guy that speaks Russian up behind the pulpit to preach to you guys, right? No, he should just sit in the, in, the, in the chair and he can speak to himself and to God. He can think about it in his own mind, in his own language, and pray to God to himself. You know what he'd do? He'd edify himself. If we put him up here, he's not going to edify anyone. Look, look at the next verse. Verse 29. Let the prophets speak two or three, and let the other judge. If anything be revealed to another that sitteth by, let the first hold his peace. What it's saying is they need to go one by one. That's why he said earlier, and that by course. Not all at the same time. Number one, two or three only in one service, but not all at the same time. They violate all those rules. Look at verse 31. For ye may all prophesy one by one, that all may learn. And all may be comforted. Verse 32. And the spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets. Remember that. I quoted that earlier. Watch verse 33. For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all the churches of the saints. Look at that verse. For God is not the author of confusion. Do you know what you have in the Pentecostal movement today, in the Pentecostal churches this morning, when they stand up and they jibber-jabber and they just a bunch of gibberish and nonsense comes out of their mouth? Do you know what it is? Confusion. It's just total and complete foolishness and confusion. Nobody understands what anyone's saying. It, they're, they're, you know, a lot of them are lying and just putting it on. It's total confusion. They're breaking every rule in the first place. And then they're not only not only that, they're not even speaking in a real tongue. Look at verse 34. Let your women keep silence in the churches, for it is not permitted unto them to speak, but they are commanded to be under obedience, as also saith the law. And this is not popular, but guess what? The women are not supposed to preach. And when you go into a Pentecostal church, what do you have all of them doing? A lot of them have the preacher behind the pulpit, number one, which is wrong and defies this verse. But number two, what do you have them doing? Speaking with tongues. Speaking in tongues, like they say. They're not speaking with tongues. They're speaking in tongues, right? They can call it speaking in tongues. I'm glad they don't say they're speaking with tongues. Because they're doing something other than what the Bible says. So they're defying that when they have the women preaching and speaking and speaking, with, uh, speaking in tongues. Verse 35, and if they will learn anything, let them ask their husbands at home, for it is a shame for a woman, for women, to speak in the church. That's talking about the congregation, not just in the church building. Church of the Bible means congregation. It's a shame for a woman to get up here and preach to the church. God has ordained men to be leaders of the church. Verse 36. What? Came the word of God out from you, or came it unto you only? There was one verse that I blew by. I'm going to end with this. I'm going to read this to you quickly. Because they say, one of these Pentecostals says, the last verse I'm going to read. One of these Pentecostals say that the evidence of salvation is this supposed speaking in tongues, right? Speaking in tongues. But the Bible actually teaches. What they're doing, keep in mind, I want to keep refreshing you. What they're doing is not the speaking with tongues that the Bible teaches. The Bible actually teaches, though, that not everyone speaks with tongues that are saved. Not every person will speak with tongues. And does that make sense? Let me ask you this. Does everyone in here speak with tongues? But how many people in here are saved? Yes. Exactly. So there are many people in here saved, but not everyone speaks with tongues. So that makes sense. We would expect that, right? 1 Corinthians chapter number 12, verse number 30 talks about, the chapter talks about all the different gifts. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter number 12, verse number 30. It says this, have all the gifts of healing. So does everybody have the gift of healing? No. <coughs> Do all speak with tongues? What's the answer? No. Do all interpret? What's the answer? No. So they say, if you don't speak with tongues, that's just proof that you're not saved. Right? If you don't speak in tongues, that's just proof that you're not saved. What do we see this morning from the one that's Pentecostal movement? Number one, they have, the, they have a false gospel. They don't even believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. They're trusting their baptism. They're trusting their works. They're trusting reforming their life. They're trusting all of these other things outside of Christ. They're not saved. They're not true Christians. You know what? We don't hate them. We want to get them to gospel. That's right. We want to love them and we want to show them that they're wrong from the Bible. We want to show them that the Bible teaches that it's only by faith. It's good news. It's not bad news. It's good news that it's only by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's good news. Amen. That it's just by faith. God loves you so much, he did all the work. Right. He did everything. And all you have to do is put all of your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. So we can see that the oneness Pentecostal movement is a sham from the very beginning. It's false from the very beginning. 
It falls from, from salvation, the most important thing. What they have in those churches are a bunch of unsaved people sitting in there. Right. They're not true Christians. So we need to get them the gospel. Amen. They, When they're speaking in tongues, it's a false movement. It's not what the Bible teaches. Now, is there a, even a shadow of doubt in your mind that every time the word tongues means it means it's language? It's clear, isn't it? Right. Every single time the word tongues comes up, it's languages. Every time or sometimes it's talking about your tongue and your mouth. That's it. They're, the movement of tongues is false. Right. They say you have to speak in tongues to be able to, you know, to go to heaven. That's proof of your salvation. That's false. That's false. It's not speaking with tongues to prove your salvation. The only proof of your salvation is you telling me what you believe. Right. Tell me what you trust in. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. That's the only fruit or proof of salvation. Right. And not everyone that's saved will speak with tongues. Not everyone that's saved, no, not everyone has the same gifts. And that is a gift just like any gift of wisdom, of skills, of workmanship, of anything like that. So, you know, we don't hate oneness Pentecostals. We love them and we want them to get saved. Now, no, let me say this very last statement. The reason why Oneness Pentecostals are not saved is not because of what I'm going to talk about tonight in part two. Their belief on the Godhead. That's not the reason why. They're wrong in a lot of areas on their belief about God and the nature of God. But that's not the reason why they're unsaved. Do you know the reason why they're unsaved? What saves you? God. Believing in God. Believing in Jesus. Right? And you know what they don't do? They don't put all their faith in Jesus. That's the reason why they're unsaved. So when you go to a one that's Pentecostal's door, do you know what you need to hammer? Baptism's not going to save you, buddy. You got a friend or a family member that's one that's Pentecostal, you don't need to try to straighten them out. They believe Jesus is God, and that's the only requirement about, about Jesus. People say, oh, they got another Jesus. Well, you could take that so far, it'd be so ridiculous. Right. I believe Jesus is a carpenter, and you don't? Well, you got another Jesus, Brother Russell. <laughs> you don't believe Jesus is a carpenter? You know how ridiculous that is? You know the only requirement about, about what you have to believe about Jesus? Jesus said that he said that they were going to die in their sins. I said unto you that you shall die in your sins. For if you believe not that I am he, you shall die in your sins. Right, right. You know, you have to believe that he's God. Right. You have to believe that he's Jehovah of the Old Testament. You know what? One does Pentecostals believe that. They may be wrong on some of the details about who God is and, 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 his, and you know, his triune nature that he possesses. But that's not why they're going to hell, my friend. They're not going to hell because they're screwed up on tongues. That's not their, their main problem. That's a problem. They're going to hell because they're not fully trusting Jesus. Right. Let's go to them and show them the grace of God and show them the gift of God and that it's free and that all you have to do is put all of your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. It's good news. It's the gospel. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father God, thank you for your word. Dear Lord, I thank you for the clarity so that we can, we, we can stand up when there is confusion and we can preach it and we can believe it and we can read it and we can understand it, dear God. We thank you that you are not the author of confusion, dear Lord, and that everything makes sense in the Bible. When we study it, it all just makes perfect sense. We thank you. Dear Lord, for everything you've done for us, for, for your grace, for just being by faith, dear God. We ask you that you would uh, bless this service, bless everyone that came today, bless our visitor, bless all the, the, the rest of the day if you could, and the service to come later, and just be with us. And in Jesus Christ's name, amen. Amen. amen.